chapter 13 Today we are finishing the series that we we've been doing on um, the church and what we want to be as a church And so Hebrews 13 and verse 9 He says, do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. Let's pray. Father, thank you so, so much, Lord, for the great privilege of knowing you. Here we are, Lord, walking through planet Earth, with all the chaos and all the benefits and all the multiplicity of things that are going on. And yet, Lord, you have reached into our world and you have uh, caused us to be here because we're interested in learning from you, to be acquainted or, or to be more intimately acquainted with you. And I pray, Father, that as your church here, as your embassy here, as your outpost from heaven here on the earth, that we will be representatives and that we have an idea of where we are heading, what it is that we want to create, what kind of atmosphere we want to create here as we yield to you. We won't really head in the right direction unless we know where we're going. And I just ask, Father, you would help us, Lord, to see who you are and how you deal with us, and how we are to deal with one another. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've been looking at this outpost from heaven on the earth. We saw that um, it is a place where the Spirit comes along, you know, it, 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 it it, he shows you, he shows us Jesus. He brings us to a place where we are more and more acquainted with Jesus. He leads us to a deeper knowledge of Jesus. And um, we are brought to a place where we rely more and more upon him. Realizing that the, he is the very hope of life. Apart from him, there is no hope. And um, we, we saw what... Um, What Eugene Peterson said, the local church is a colony of heaven in the country of death. We are a place, in a sense, kind of like Kabul airport at the moment. I mean, it is absolutely bananas what is going on. But people are realizing that 
it's it's you know the the Taliban are taking over. They are gonna very uh, they are the 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 judgment of the Taliban is going to come down soon and people are fleeing from their lives to the airport. In a sense, the, the Bible says exactly that. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous flee to it and are safe. And you know, we are to be a place where people are, are, are safe, where people are growing, where people are learning, where people are, are, have the, the space to get to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, and I want to do just that. We read a verse. There are strange teachings. There are uh, all kinds of weird ways that people think that they are right with God. But the writer of the Hebrews says, but it is good for the heart to be established by grace. And I want to talk about three things Three ways that God deals with us and three ways in which we should deal with one another if we are going to be representatives of him here on the earth. Number one, God gives people time. God gives people whom he is calling time. God is patient. I know it might sound strange, but I mean, I think in our lives more than ever, and, and I, if, look, when I lived in London, we moved here to, Virgi to, to Virginia, to Mallorca, and we saw a man, and, he's, and, and, and he said to us, man, the pace is so hectic in Mallorca. And I thought, my goodness, I feel like time stood still when I moved to Mallorca. And I said to him, where did you come from? And of course, we came from London. And he says, I came from the Sahara. <laughs> and of course, it's relative. You come from the Sahara here and everything is just kind of like just hustle and bustle. But you come from London here and everything is just like super slow. And I think that we are so detached from Bible times that we don't realize how much faster time, how, how much faster we want things and, got, and, and we expect things than, than, than the people in the, in the scriptures did. And God is patient. God has much more patience than we do. And one person I would like to be able to illustrate this with today is the life of Abraham. Now, just to get you where we're going, we're going to look at God gives us time, God gives us space, and God gives us grace. And for the one on time, I want to look at the life of Abraham. Because he is heralded as the epitome of faith, Epitome, epitome of, of what a, a man walking by faith is. But I think in the church, what we have done is we've made, we've made these people into heroes to be imitated as opposed to people that God dealt with, with tremendous grace, with tremendous patience, with tremendous um, space that he gave them. So when you look at Abraham, uh, automatically we just think to ourselves, oh my goodness, this is so amazing, the blessing of God. In Genesis chapter 12, if you want to turn there with me, it says that in Genesis chapter 12, that God came to Abraham and he said to him, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make you a great and I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of all of the earth shall be blessed. My goodness, what an amazing moment. But there's a little verb there. It says, now the Lord had said to Abraham. It's the past tense. And we know that he said that to him in Ur. He said to him, get out of your country, leave your father's house, and go to a land that I will show you. But actually, um, it says in verse 4 that he departed from, um, from Haran. 
So actually, when God called him to leave Ur and leave his father and, and his father's household, he moved to Haran with his father. And then once his father died, he went to the land of Canaan. And you say, so what? Well, I think sometimes Abraham is painted as a person that God spoke to him, and he left with no struggles at all. And I think he actually struggled. I think he struggled to leave his father. He moved nearby Ur, but not the land of Canaan. He didn't go away to where God was calling him. And he actually waited till his father died in order to go to the land that God was showing him. Point being that he was not as obedient as sometimes we paint Abraham to be. He struggled with the move. He struggled with listening to the word of God. He struggled from becoming more dependent on that word that he gave than on his own logic or emotions. And you know what? It's okay that he struggled. The promise came to Abraham that he would be made into a great nation. And God knew exactly when and how, but Abraham struggled with the timing. Remember? He's like, how am I going to be a great nation if I don't even have a child? And it took years. I think it's like 25 years before Isaac was born. 25 years from the promise. And we all know the struggle. He struggled and he said, oh, I mean, Sarah said, look, we're not going to have a child anytime soon. Why don't you go with Hagar? He struggled with that. Then the promise came to Abraham that he would bless whoever blesses him and curse whoever cursed him. And look at chapter 12, verse 11. Of, of Genesis. Look what it says. It says that when they moved from Haran and they moved towards and they went through Egypt and they were going to go into the land of Canaan, they, 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 they went to Egypt and it says, and it came to pass in verse 11, when he was close to entering Egypt, now remember, he's entering Egypt with the promise, whoever blesses you, I will bless, and whoever curses you, I will curse. He goes into Egypt with that promise, and he says to Sarah, Sarah, we're about to go into Egypt, and you are so beautiful. I mean, isn't that nice that he thought his wife was beautiful? You know, he's like, you're so beautiful. Then when we go into Egypt, they're going to see you, and when they find out that you're my wife, they're going to kill me, and they're going to do good to you. He says, I got a plan. When we go to Egypt, just tell him you're my sister, not my wife. Isn't that Abraham? Great plan, isn't he? I mean, you could almost say Abraham and, and Sarah were the great schemers. You know, it's just like, hey, look, Haran is far enough. Um, just say you're my sister. Let's have Hagar. All the things that doubt produce. In contrast of that which faith waiting on God produces. But his fear caused them not only to lie, but to cause his wife to lie. And you can just see her going, yeah, that's my brother. <laughs> He's like, okay, well, we're going to take her on. You're going to become Pharaoh's wife. And you would think like, okay, that was in his early life. But certainly, as he grew, he must have changed. Turn to Genesis chapter 20. Because it says this. It says, And Abraham journeyed from there to the south and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and stayed in Gerar. Now Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, This is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah but God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. Oh, my goodness. I mean, here Abraham goes, hey, it's my sister. And then it's God that actually has to stop Abimelech and says, you better not touch that guy, that girl. 
that girl is married to another guy. And Abimelech goes, hey, 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 you know that I thought it was a sister. Don't do anything here. Hold your horses. I've done what was righteous. And then God says, it's okay. Abraham's going to pray for you. But wait a minute. Abraham that just lied? Yes, Abraham is my prophet, and he is going to pray for you. And everything's going to be okay. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing that all, all the mess that the doubts in Abraham produced, and yet the time that God gave him to grow. God gave Abraham time to grow. How many of you guys think I've become a Christian and all of a sudden I must be perfect? It's a process. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until, until that day. He says, work out your salvation, your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to do for his good pleasure. But we keep in step with what he's doing. And you know what? It is wonderful. When the Holy Spirit comes into our life, he begins to deal with areas in our life. And we talked about this recently. In, in us first, it was our own thoughts of ourselves, and then, or for me at least. And then I got married, and it was just like, oh my goodness, how do we grow in this realm? And then you have kids, and all goes out the window. But it's like, okay, so how do I grow here? And then you pastor a church, and, and then, but everything is just growing experiences. But God deals with us area by area by area. You know how? In time. It is called the fruit of the Spirit and not the factory of the Spirit. And fruit takes time. The other day, um, Dusty and, 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 um, and Britta, here at uh, a church, they just bought a house and it has a fig tree. And a few weeks ago, uh, Britta, they had not moved here yet. And she said to Loretta, hey, go to the house and grab all the fig trees, all the figs you want. And so she sends me, go get figs. And I got over there and they were all green. They just weren't ready. I couldn't shake the tree. I couldn't. Force the tree, I had to wait for the fruit to ripen. And in the same way, in our lives, we must realize that God gives time to us to grow. God gives us time to grow. God has been so patient with us and is so patient with us giving us not time to know him, giving us time to grow in him, and giving us time to change in him. Even after our greatest failures, God gives us time. Because sometimes we think, okay, so God gives me time as long as I'm progressive and moving in a direction. But the moment I fail, red card, you're out of the game. But I mean, look at Peter. I mean, Peter's, Peter's the guy that Jesus comes to him and he says, hey, Peter, cast your net on the other side. Oh, Jesus, we've been working all night. You ever been, you ever worked all night? I used to work in nightclubs. Nothing was worse than 6 a.m., 5 a.m. And if someone would come to you and say, can you stay a couple more hours, particularly going past 7, 8 to 9 it was just like the worst. And that Jesus would say to him, cast your hand. We've labored all night, Jesus. We caught nothing. We're not going to catch anything now. His attitude, his know-it-all attitude. And then he cast the nets on the other side, and boom, they caught that big thing of fish. Then Jesus goes over and he says, the son of man must suffer. He must be uh, reviled. He must be beaten. He must be crucified. But on the third day, he will rise again. And Peter says, in his great understanding of the philosophy of ministry of Jesus, he says, you will not suffer. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You only have the things of man in mind. And you know what's amazing 
that he wasn't done with them yet. Then afterwards, the garden comes. And he, and, he, and he takes a sword. And here Jesus, bless those who curse you. Here Jesus is, is speaking so, um, he's establishing his mission. He already gave him the Sermon on the Mount. And this guy grabs a sword and he cuts, Peter cuts the guy's ear off, completely misrepresenting Jesus. And if that's not enough, in the morning, they asked him, hey, who is this Jesus? Are, aren't you one of his disciples? I have no idea who he is. I don't know who this Jesus is. Okay, so he misunderstands the mission. He's grumbling in the mission. He denies Jesus. What would you do with a guy that denies you, that misunderstands you, that rebukes you, and is grumpy towards you? What would you do towards that guy? You know what Jesus did after the ascension? He said, hey, Peter, you have the keys. You preached the first sermon. When Moses came down with the law, with those tablets, he didn't even make it down the hill. The, the tablets were broken. 3,000 people died. The day Peter preached, 3,000 thousand people came to life like life had never been known before and God used a guy that had failed them greatly it's like Paul said where sin abounds grace abounds all the more isn't that amazing isn't that isn't he like that with you hasn't he been Amazing in the time that he has given us. I mean, here you see Peter three and a half years and the rest that he had. God gave him time. So this is, now this is the real, the real thing here. This is like the real mysterious thing that seems like we never get. God gives us time and therefore we should give each other time. <laughs> Because it's amazing, you know, we are recipients of this grace, of this, of this patience. But in the same way, we can be so gracious on ourselves, but so hard on other people. I think I told you this last week when we were when at church, uh, last week here at the second service. But um, we were at the dock in Austria and there was a viper and I, I think it was a viper, and it was, it was behind the, the kayaks. And so all the kids were going crazy, a viper, a viper. And Brian goes with a stick, and, 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 and uh, you know, they're all Christian kids with their Christian parents, with missionary pastors. And, 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 and I'm just like, oh, Jonathan, please, don't, don't come up with weird things, you know. And next thing you know, he comes out, and all I could hear is everybody's just curious, wanting to see it. No, not Jonathan. Jonathan's like, kill it, kill it, cut his head. Head off! <laughs> and it was in a tunnel, you know, so it all sounded even stronger. And I just looked at Jonathan, what is your problem? Don't you realize we're in a Christian conference? Stop that! And then I just gave it to him. And I have a friend that works in California. She's the one that organizes all like the missions trips and, and trips that they do there in, in Southern California, and Costa Mesa. And she says to me, you're going to demoralize him. And then she said these words to me. She says, how would you treat Jonathan if you knew the Lord was going to come through in his life in two years' time? And I was just so convicted. I mean, she said other stuff to me that I told her, you're just bananas, you know. Um, but, but this one, I had to tell her, I said, when you said that to me, I just felt like it was the word of the Lord for me. And, 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 and that means that, you know, we, give, we are patient. We give time. Jonathan needs time to grow. Here at church, People come with all kinds of messes from all kinds of backgrounds that you know nothing about. 
And we are not here to pass judgment on one another. We are here to be able to sit here in a place where we are given time to grow. Because God gives us time, we give each other time. And that means that we are not expecting instant change. It means that we want to see people as God sees people. And you know what? Dave Shirley, the, my pastor, the, the guy I met a few weeks after, I became, a couple of days after I became a Christian, he had this amazing ability, and he always did it from the verse, your walls are ever before me in Isaiah. And he, was, and, and he has this amazing ability to see people as they're going to be and not as they are. This amazing ability to see people as they're going to be, not as they are. Isn't that what Jesus did with Peter? You are Peter. You shall be a rock. Saul of Tarsus, Paul. He shall be a great witness. Seeing people as they are going to be. So when people come through these doors to be able to say, oh, my goodness, just wait. You know, I used to salivate. There's a missionary in Hungary. He was the pastor of the largest church, Calvary Chapel in Hungary, or the largest Calvary Chapel in Europe, for that matter. And he, he would all, I would salivate when he talked, because he's like, oh, man, in the early days when we had our Bible study, he's like, people would come in, and as soon as they came in through those doors, we just smiled at them and told them, Woo! just a couple of days, you'll become a Christian, you know? And it was true. People would come in, and they'd just be, Come born again, and then they go growing. And now, this past year, they actually turned the church over to all national Hungarians, and they run the thing on their own. And some of those are some of them that became Christians, but they didn't turn the church over to them right away. They gave them time to grow. Number two, to give each other space. We should give each other space. God gives us Tons of space, doesn't he? Space to be different while one. Space to like different things. Space within the boundaries of God, but within the boundaries of God, there's great diversity of personality. I mean, I'm amazed. The, the backgrounds of people that come here, the backgrounds of people that God, um, over the years I have met. I have met uh, an Iranian that was on his way to kill the pastor. He was planning how to kill the pastor. And he became a Christian. I've met uh, people that were on drugs. I've met, I met people that they were just super nice people. And they just one day decided to read through the Bible and they became Christians. And, and some people that like heavy metal, some people that like rap, some people that like surfing, some people that like computers, some, be, you know, people with, some people that are sports fanatics, some, you know, all kinds of backgrounds, people that like sailing, all kinds of diverse things. You know, what God has created a wonderfully diverse creation, wonderfully diverse people. Not for us to make them just like we want them to be, but to allow people who be they, who they are apart from sin. With their personalities. And thus, we have different types of worship, for example. You know, some people are like, I can only worship with old Maranatha. Others are just like, no, 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 I just want hymns. Oh, no, no, I like trendy. If it's, if it's, if it's, I don't like old school. If it's longer than six weeks old, I don't sing it. But the beauty of it is to give each other space to be who we are. Wasn't it nice to have um, gospel tribe here? And for the, us not to make them anything else but who they are? I mean, I laughed. I said, hey, guys, you can have the Sunday. You know, when Alex was here, it's like my biggest struggle was always just let him be who he is. You know, we need to let each other be who they are, develop as God has developed us. We had Anwar here, and I remember one point. Anwar, you know Anwar, you could hear him. You, the old tapes, they're all ruined. You know, when we had messages here at the church, they're all ruined. 
because he laughed in the middle of it. And he had that, that unique laugh that you would stop listening to the message and just focus. That's Anwar. And at one point, he just talks a lot, and he talks loud, and he has strong opinions. And at one point, I just said to him, please, allow the Holy Spirit to shape you, but don't become somebody else. Someone that's honest is refreshing. Be who you are. The other day, we were at... um, There's two people in our lives that are, in my life personally, that are always late. Julie and Heidi. Julie was here a few weeks ago, and Heidi's right here. And the other day, we were supposed to meet at the park. And uh, at least we thought we were supposed to meet at the park. And 45 minutes later, Jonathan says, where is Heidi? And then he looks at me and he said this, how can you put up with it, Dad? Heidi's always late. And I said, you know what? I just don't stress out when I have to go meet Heidi. I just realize I can be late too. <laughs> you know, you're not, there's, you're not going to change Heidi. You're not going to change Julie. Julie's like, I'm coming over in such a time for, for food. We're going to come and eat. Yeah, right. She'll change the plans a bunch of times. Remember, we're supposed to eat. It's like, I'm talking to Julie. It's like, we're going to go to Magaluf. No, no, no. Everything's changed. We're going to Palma Nova. Everything, but you know what? There's beauty in allowing people to be who they are. Giving each other space. You see, when the disciples were walking on the road, as Jesus was focused going to the cross, they were speaking about who was going to be the greatest. Here Jesus is going to go die, and the disciples are, going, are talking about who is going to be the greatest. And Jesus didn't just slap them around. He just very gently gave them space. And they said, the Gentile rulers, they do that. But whoever wants to be the greatest among you, let him become the servant of all. He gave him space to change. Not like me, my goodness. I'm like a pit bull. One of the greatest marriage problems Loretta and I had was when we got in an argument, once I got going, I was unstoppable. And Loretta would run to her room to avoid the conflict by this time, even if she had started it. Sometimes I would start it, but even if she had started it, she would run into the room to avoid the conflict, and you would think that would stop me? No, no, no. Let's talk about it right now. Let's deal with it right now. Right now, we're going to do it. Let's talk. Let's talk. I don't want to. Just give me space. No, right now, right now. And next thing you know, Loretta pops out. What she needed was space. And isn't it amazing sometimes how God, he so graciously gives us space to be who we are, to give us uh, that space to deal with situations, to, to reconsider. And we are able to receive these from God. And the question I have is, are you able to receive the space that God gives you, the leash? Of course, some of us have leashes that are shorter than others. I have a very tight, it seems like there's a real tight one on me. But, but I mean, to be able to enjoy the, the space that God gives us to grow, do we receive this? And if we receive it, do we give others the space that they need to grow? I don't like it when people get too close, you know, when, when uh, and I don't mean physically, but uh, I, I remember one guy saying to me, I'm going to disciple you. I was enough in cults that I didn't want anybody too close that way, you know. I kind of like the, the, the pastoring that I've received has always been one, and I said it a few weeks ago, I said, the Holy Spirit knows how to speak to you. And if you do something really bad, I will let you know. But at the end of the day, giving you the space to get to know the Lord for yourself. And then finally, grace, which in some ways is encaptured in all of those. But you will see that I mean something a little bit different. I mean, God gives us generously what we don't deserve. He ever surprises us with his kindness, his strength, 
his fulfilled promises, his smile and favor when we least expect it. God gives us generously what we don't deserve, and he ever surprises us with his kindness, strength, fulfilled promises, smile, and favor when we least expect it. Turn with me to to, um, 1 Kings chapter 19. Um, We see Elijah... In probably a way that sometimes we, we, we don't even realize that the people of God would go through. You see, Elijah had had an incredible victory uh, against the northern kingdom of Israel. They had gone completely apostate, and they were worshiping the Baals. They were um, so far from God, it was incredible. And, and Elijah stood firm. He stood, stood firm with the Lord, and he just, he built an altar in front of all of them, in front of the whole nation there, the prophets, and, and he actually saturated it with water to make it impossible to light up. And then the, Elijah, the, the Ahab, the Baal prophets, they built an altar, and they built it um, ready with kindled just to get it burning and then Elijah said well let's call on God see whoever whichever God answers it uh, is is the God it's God whoever answers is God and these guys are cutting themselves and said oh Lord oh and they're cutting themselves hear us hear us all this effort all this self-effort and and then he says are your God sleepy Elijah says to them why don't you call a little bit louder Are they sleeping? And he uses sarcasm like crazy, you know? And then eventually, Elijah just says, Oh, Lord, just hear me when I pray and that they may know that you are the God of Israel. Just pray that you would consume this. And boom, the thing that was saturated with fire, with water, just lit and the and the sacrifice was consumed the altar and 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 everybody's just like oh my goodness and 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 the prophets were uh killed and 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 ahab is just shocked and he's told them if Baal is Baal, worship Baal, and if jehovah's jehovah worship jehovah and and you know you see this i mean you see iron man you see superman you see this incredible um a gladiator, you see this incredible show of power, of manliness, of strength, and you think to yourself, oh my goodness, you just want to be just like Elijah, until you read chapter 19. When you read chapter 19, it says that Jezebel found out about what Elijah said, it's like, I'm going to kill you. I mean, remember, he just stood up against the whole nation, and now he's going to run from Jezebel, from this woman, from a threat. And verse 3 says, and when he saw that, he arose, ran for his life, and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under the broom tree, and he prayed, listen to this, he prayed that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, the, now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And it is so amazing to me because we've seen the attitude. We've seen the denial of, of Peter. We're going to look at a minute at John. But we see here that this man who had so faithfully served the Lord all of a sudden is completely depressed and he is wishing that he could just die or that God himself would kill him. He's depressed. He's unbelieving. He's doubting. He's struggling. And you would think to yourself, I mean, he's, he, he's going through a depression and you would think to yourself, how is God going to deal with this man going through a depression? Will God be angry with him? Will God kick him in the butt and said, get a life, buddy? Why are you doubting? How is he going to deal with him? 
And look how he dealt with them. He dealt with them. In verse 5, it says, Then as he laid and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And then he looked. And there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and laid down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat. Please eat because the journey is too great for you. The journey for what? The journey was the journey far away from the will of God. Further away from the will of God. Sorry, I woke you up. Further away from um, f- uh, through where, where his fears were driving him. He's actually following his fears. He's walking away from the will of God. And, and God says, and, and the angel says to Elijah, eat for this journey is too much for you. And he actually feeds them and strengthens them. While he's in depression. He is kind to him. He nourishes him. And then he says to him, when he gets 40 days journey, he says to him, now go to the mountain, go to the side. And he says that he saw the wind, but God was not in the wind. And of course, Elijah was used to um, meteorological uh, things with the water and the rain and stuff like that. And then he says that there was an earthquake and, there, and God was not in the earthquake. And then there was fire and he had, saw, he had seen fire um, consume um, you know, the, the, the offering, and, and, and it says that, and God was not in those things. And then there was a still, small voice, and God was in that voice. And it is amazing to me that in the midst of his depression, in the midst of his anxiety, in the midst of running away from the very will of God, that God was not rough with him, but was actually very kind to him gentle with him, even nourishing him. Is this the God you know? Is this the God that you know in your life? Because this is the God of the Bible. And it is Elijah that God took out of this world like no other man who was ever taken out of this world, a chariot of fire came to get him, to take him home. Oh, the grace exceeding. And you have John as well, very briefly. John was with Jesus in Samaria when, when Jesus wanted to go through Samaria, and it says that Samaritans rejected him because he was going to Jerusalem. Because of religious preferences, they rejected Jesus. And John said to Jesus, should we call fire from heaven and devour this people? You ever feel like that? Jonathan, we, the whole thing was uh, Afghanistan is going on. And there's a beautiful film on Netflix called The Bread Maker. If you get to watch it, it's an animated film about Afghanistan. And it's this little girl whose dad gets arrested, and they're all sisters except the little brother too small to do anything. And so this girl actually has to cut her hair and make herself look like a boy to actually function in society. And um, so obviously it shows the Taliban and, 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 and all this stuff. And this morning, accidentally, somebody threw a newspaper into our house, like a delivery, a newspaper. So my father-in-law picked it up and he put it in the, in the, on the kitchen counter. And there was a picture of a Taliban. And there's Jonathan with a stick, you know, with his vengeance. You know, he's like with a stick just hitting the Taliban on his head, you know. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, this guy, he's just something else. Cut its head off. Kill it. That's the snake. But I mean, same mentality towards the Taliban, you know. And, and, um, and, and you can sort of take something like that and want to quench it. But here, Jesus, when John says, should we call fire down from heaven and consume them? Jesus says to him, you only have the things of man in mind, not the things of God. And he said, I did not come to destroy man's life, but to save them. 
And so no doubt John was rebuked. And no doubt probably John thought he was disqualified. And yet very briefly years later, when the Samaritans received the gospel through Philip, God said to Philip, hey, go to a guy on a road to Ethiopia, and I want you, I, and, then, and then to John, says, John, I want you to go to Samaria. And it was John that prayed for them not to receive fire and be consumed from heaven, but actually to receive fire and be restored and refreshed from heaven. Notice, God gave them an opportunity after failure. Is this the God that you know? Is your confidence in a God that after you failed the greatest, you can still look for him for great opportunities because he is the God who is gracious to us? Do we have our minds transformed to see this, the graciousness, the kindness, the generosity of disposition, the opportunities that God gives to us? And I'm going to follow up with a question. Are you only recipients of that, or are you able to extend that grace, kindness, generosity of disposition to other people? I mean, we can all have different views about stuff. It just seems like now we live in times that you, can have, you cannot have a different view about anything. If you have a different view, you cease to be gracious to one another. Can we be gracious and kind to one another? There was somebody, somebody that was um, just texting Loretta nonstop putting her under pressure to do this. And I remember when I became the pastor, the, the pastor here, I said to you guys, to the church, but it was a different group altogether, so maybe I have to say it again. I said, Loretta is not the pastor's wife. She is my wife. She's not the church maid. She's not the church responsible person. She is my wife. And then I told Loretta, whatever God puts on your heart to do, you do that, but never do it because of pressure from people. But anyway, there was this person just texting Loretta, you should be doing this, you should be doing that, and what da, 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 and you're the pastor's wife, and you should be doing this, and you should be doing that, and blah, 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 pressure, 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 pressure. And then finally, Loretta just said to her, you know what? I don't think God has given you this responsibility to be on top of me like this. And then she said, the, the, the person said, I'm going to pray for you. And Loretta said, I don't need you to pray for me. I need you to be kind to me. I need you to be kind. And you know what, guys? We receive so much kindness from God, so much grace, so much unmerited favor, so much good disposition from God that we should not be hoarders of this, but we should be conduits of this. We should be gracious to one another because we've received so much grace. We should be empathetic. We should not see things from our viewpoint merely. We should put ourselves in other people's shoes and be empathetic rather than apathetic. We should extend kindness to one another. And you know what? My desire and the reason I'm saying this if we give each other time, if we give each other space, if we give each other grace, we create, alongside the Lord, we create an environment where we, are, can, we, where we, can, we can worship, we can give ourselves to the teaching of the word, we can learn, we can fellowship, and we can... Grow in our relationship with one another. Now, I must say this. We will benefit from this as long as all of us are part of this. So let me, let me give you an example. If this time, space, and grace environment, it will allow us to come together and worship sincerely and loving, but beware 
there be anybody, somebody or many people that are just like demanding this time, space, and grace, but never changing. Right? So we demand it from others, but we don't extend that to others. That, that is called nowadays, the famous word is, is uh, narcissistic. The famous word is, the, the popular word at the moment is narcissistic. You give me time, space, and grace, but I do none of that to you. Because at the end of the day, it's all about me. And we could misuse it, but if we use it right, if we use it right, this sets the environment of mutually respecting and giving us time to grow, space to grow, and grace to grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. We can come together and we can open the word, not wondering how people are going to judge us, how people are going to push us, how people are going to maybe frown at us, but we're able to look at each other and say, it doesn't matter where we come from. And I'll close with this. There was a woman who wanted to marry Henry, um, oh, Matthew Henry. And, and, Ma and, and, Ma and this woman's dad, who was a pastor, said, who is this Matthew Henry? Because he came from a lower class. In the UK, I guess these classes are a big deal. And he came from a lower class. And he's like, who is this Ma Matthew Henry? And where does he come from? And the woman replied the classic, the classic um, response. And she says, I don't know where he comes from, but I sure know where he is going. Where are we heading together? I don't care what kind of music you like, to, you like. I don't care how you dress. I don't care what country you come from. I don't care where politics are in the country you come from. The, what I care about is we know Jesus and the hope of the world is Jesus. And how are we growing in that together and giving each other that time to grow, that space to grow and that grace to encourage us to keep going and grow in that and in, in all that God has for us. So, can we give each other that? Can we kind of engrave those three words into our minds and hearts and say, you know what, this is how, what I've received from God and this is what I want to give other people. So let's pray together. Lord, we are so thankful that you have been so gracious with us. And Lord, we wouldn't be, you are the hope of the world. We have nothing that we have not received from you. There is nobody greater than you in the universe. There's nobody close to as good, as kind, as gracious, as perfect as you. And yet, you're not impatient with us. You're not uptight with us, and you're not angry with us. And I pray, Father, that you would help us, Lord. Help our minds be transformed in this. Help us to get this for our own souls. Help us never to use it as an excuse not to grow, but rather that that gives us the environment to grow And help us to extend that grace to one another, Lord. We love you and are so grateful, Lord, for your hand upon our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
So, so before, um, after I prepared this message, because I've had this, this, these three words on my mind, uh, and I wanted to express, you know, just to share about that, how God deals with us. After that, I read this quote, which I read a few weeks ago here. But listen to this. Raymond Ort- Ortland wrote, the gospel, the ch- uh, How the Church Portrays the Beauty of Christ is the, um, the book. It says, the family of God is where people behave in a new way. I think of it with a simple equation. Gospel, safety, time. The family of God is where people should find lots of gospel, lots of safety, and lots of time. In other words, people need multiple exposures to the happy news of the gospel from one end of the Bible to the other. The safety of non-accusing sympathy so they can admit their problems honestly and enough time to rethink their lives on a deep level because people are complex and changing is not easy. In a, church, in a gentle church like this, no one is put under pressure or singled out for embarrassment. Everyone is free to open up, and we all grow together as we look to Jesus. Behaving well in the household of God sets the tone of gospel plus safety plus time for everyone. This is what sets the church apart as a new kind of community. In other words, a grace-filled church. So may God bless you, and may we continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, and may that impact our own personal lives, our family lives, our social life, our work life, our church life, every single area of our lives. May God bless you. Amen. Capture my heart, I surrender my will, focus my mind till I'm yielded and still, hearing your voice to answer your call, carried away till I can't speak. Carry me